Moore. Dr. Moore is the John Malone Jr. MD Endowed Chair and Scientific Director of the CS Mott Center for uh, Human Growth and Development at Wayne State University. He's also the Professor of OBGYN and Chair of the Department of Physiology. He has been a tenured professor prior to that for OBGYN and Reproductive Sciences at Yale. And in his research, research, he examines topics related to immunology of pregnancy and role of inflammation in cancer formation and progression. He was the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Reproductive Immunology and the past president of the American Society for the same. He has, fund, he has been funded from grants from the National Institute of Child Health Development, National Cancer Institute, as well as the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, and has been the recipient of several national and international prizes. We are very interested in your talk, Dr. Moore, and we look forward to it. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, and thank you for the, the, the case. It really opens my discussion, and I'm happy that I prepared this lecture in the way that it did, because um, what I want really to, to touch the subject is uh, how the immune system behaves during pregnancy. And there is so many misconceptions that hopefully some of the points that I'm going to bring today will help uh, to, um, to understand why pregnancy is not a monolithic aspect immunologically, and every different components in the pregnancy, including the transfer of antibodies, there is a specific time when antibodies are moving from the mother into the fetus, um, and so on. So let's start. I have, uh, unfortunately, I have no conflicts to this class, so I don't going to discuss uh, any subject that has uh, uh, financial conflicts. What I wanted to cover, and we will see how much we go in the next, uh, I think, 45 minutes. I want to review the immunological aspects of pregnancy, going a little even to the basic concepts. Uh, what is the aspect of the immune tolerance during pregnancy? Uh, and I use what we do, whether we work as viral infections and environmental factors, how had an implication both maternal and fetal. But I think we can learn everybody from those models uh, in terms of everything that is happening during pregnancy. So, so let's go to... Um, the general concepts of the immunology during pregnancy. And already I can tell you that I, I, I thought so that some of my concepts maybe are not so up to date, but I hear some misconceptions during even the discussion of this case that it makes sense that I go through this, uh, this, um, uh, this presentation. Uh, human pregnancy is a unique immunological condition. Why? Because it has to confront in one side this immunological paradigm that is the paternal uh, antigens or what is called the tolerance to paternal antigens. And second, because it's the pregnant woman or the pregnant female in any species lives in an environment that is dangerous, uh, is continuously exposed to bacterial and viral infections as the case that we are living today with uh, COVID um, that is, uh, is not uh, infecting not only non-pregnant women, but as a sort of local pregnant woman. <clears throat> and I, I called um, this the in unique immunological condition. Uh, with this concept that was introduced almost 60 years ago by Sir Medawar, that he proposed that the fetus is the semi allograft I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. And because it's, a semi, it is, it's like a semi allograft uh, similar to tissue graft, escapes immune rejection through mechanisms involving systemic immune suppression. And I hear the fellow that mentioned exactly that, that the concept that pregnant women, many of these changes are because systemic immune suppression. And the field of the tissue and the, the, the studies in the area of immunology of pregnancy have focused on the graft host response. I just can tell you from now that Sid Meda will go the Nobel Prize with this concept that the, the pregnant woman escapes uh, rejection because it's immune suppression. Now, um, uh, and we were one of the first ones to show that, he was totally, not totally, he was wrong in the concept of why uh, a woman escapes immune suppression. The concept of systemic immune suppression really is totally wrong, and I will show you why. So another aspect that uh, is fascinating, if you take the uterus, uh, the implantation side with the embryos penetrating, you will find all the immunological cells that exist in our body, everything, including B cells. For many years, it was thought that there was no B cells. There is B cells present in the uterus. Um, 
NK cells, T cells, dendritic cells, and so on. So everybody who was working following the hypothesis of Medawar as a conflict between the immune system of the, uh, of the mother and the fetus, the presence of these immune cells was the evidence that indeed the paternal antigens were reacting with the maternal immune system and inducing a very strong anti-fetal immune response. And only when there was a mechanism of immune suppression, then the mother will survive. But if there was no mechanism of immune suppression, then the pregnancy will be terminated. The reality is the opposite, that depletion of immune cells at the maternal fetal interface has detrimental effects to survival of the fetus. It will remove dendritic cells, there is no implantation. It will remove macrophages, there is no trophoblast invasion. If there is no NK cells, there is no the remodeling of the spiral arteries and a continuous and so on. Yeah. So immune cells at the implantation site, not only that are necessary for the protection of the mother and the fetus against infections, they are required, they are essential for the normal process of implantation, invasion, and parturation later on. And I will mention in a minute about that. Yeah. Let me pass this. So in, in summarizing what I just told you, uh, at the time of implantation or during the pregnancy, the, um, the immune cells are playing a critical role by guiding the implantation process, the trophoblast invasion. And each of those immune cells are essential in, in the different biological process of, of pregnancy. HCG, one of the earliest uh, hormones, if not the earliest hormones secreted by the blastocyst, is an immune modulator. And I, I heard the comments who were very pointed out that the levels of HCG, you can correlate also with the activity of, of uh, antibody production and so on, and even the symptomatology. That's correct because HCG is a major regulator of B cell product, of B cell differentiation and antibody production. But it, the, 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 the major signals that are coming early in pregnancy by the drastic increase of ACG, that immunomodulation is happening in the early pregnancy, as you know very well, ACG then it start going down uh, in the second trimester. So <clears throat> the increased mortality during the pregnancy due to infection has, and again, many of the autoimmune processes that, uh, like grave disease that has mentioned to the now, has been attributed to this maternal immune, uh, immune suppression, yeah, because it's necessary to prevent rejection. And as I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, that is totally wrong. The maternal immune system is not suppressed during pregnancy. A maternal immune suppression, or what we call a systemic immune suppression, will be detrimental for the survival of the species. Yeah? Just imagine if every pregnant, if every woman or every female in general nature, if during the most important period of evolution, that is pregnancy, will be immune suppressed, any infection, any pandemic will kill that, that female or that woman and the species will disappear. So, and we have the best example now. Again, I have been talking for many years and there always has been a lot of challenges with this concept, but I think we have the best evidence. Now with COVID, a pregnant women were infected with COVID. Like non, while non-pregnant women were dying, pregnant women did not die. The majority of pregnant women that got infected with COVID did not die. They managed the pregnancy very well. They managed the infection very well. So systemic immune suppression represents a danger to the species. And there is absolutely no evidence of systemic immune suppression. The opposite, the opposite, the immune system during pregnancy is stronger than ever is stronger than ever. And I'll show you a minute, and it will change forever. The immune system of a pregnant woman will change forever. A critical aspect, why this concept we need to introduce in everybody, especially in those who do um, guidelines uh, during pregnancy, because the, the idea that a pregnant woman and immune suppressed has led to many uh, 
decisions that affect the pregnant woman, such as vaccination, for example. For me, and I wrote several articles, including one in the New York Times, uh, challenging this concept because we were depriving, and I repeat, we were depriving a protection, an essential protection for the mother and the baby by not including pregnant women in clinical trials of vaccination. And it's a crime, in my opinion, that we vaccinated uh, elderly people and people in, in group risk and so on. And the last group that was vaccinated were pregnant women, which the ones should have been the first group to be vaccinated and protected against the, um, the, the infections. So this um, wrong concept has been priming for almost 70 years that pregnant woman uh, is immune suppressed not only has affected the way we treat pregnant women without immune diseases and with many other diseases, but also has affected the way how we approach uh, the protection of pregnant women during pandemics, such as uh, COVID-19. And, and what it makes the difference, and again, I'm sure you come to the question way, but you are talking about something that is real, that is that the fetus is a semi allograft yeah? So, and we know that there are changes in the, in the immune system during the pregnancy. But those changes in the immune system during pregnancy are associated with the factors that are released by the placenta and the fetal unit, who are going to modify the maternal immune system, as I mentioned to you, forever. So during the pregnancy, there is mechanism that will suppress the antigen recognition for the father forever, not only for the time of the pregnancy. There is no a transitional tolerance to paternal antigens. That is another aspect that is totally wrong. The, the, the immune uh, tolerance to paternal antigens are specific and will remain for the rest of the life of the woman. Why? Because any pregnant woman is populated by fetal cells, and those fetal cells incorporate into the organ, into the body of the woman, and they will stay for the rest of her life. And I will can go with many cases that I have uh, consulted and we have studied, including uh, liver problems with fetal cells regenerate the liver, uh, and and they will stay forever. Studies. Um, don't don't um, uh, in in breast cancer or in many other tissues showing that every pregnant woman becomes a chimeric with the fetal cells. And again, if the immune tolerance will be just during the period of the pregnancy, so all those fetal cells will create many problems. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. But in the majority of the cases, in the, I repeat, in the majority of these cases those fetal cells are incorporated and they are not rejected because the tolerance is for the rest of the life of the pregnant woman. And again, the other aspect that I want to, the message that I want to leave with you, and I hope that that will accomplish this lecture, is that the, the, the immune system of the mother during pregnancy is not weaker, is not um, um, suppressed, the opposite, the immune system of the mother during pregnancy is stronger than the non-pregnant. So that's number two. Number three, there is a long-term changes on the maternal immune system. And again, we always talk that when the pregnancy ends, the, the immune system of the mother goes back to the non-pregnant stage. Yeah. And Every pregnancy, there is exactly the same change. It's from a, 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 a basal level of what it was to uh, in, in just during the, the period of pregnancy. So we did a study that we published recently, and what we show when we compare, again, looking just at peripheral blood, just at peripheral blood, if we compare many of the characteristics of the immune system in the non-pregnant woman, versus the immune system two years after the pregnancy, two years after the pregnancy, 
the immune system, the characteristics of many of those immune cells were totally different from the woman before she ever got pregnant. Yeah. And here comes the important, the in, interesting aspect because those changes are also when the comp are, are, they also happen when the pregnancy are abnormal. Yeah. So abnormal pregnancies, such as the preeclampsia or miscarriages, the immune system two years after that pregnancy are changed, but they are different from the normal pregnancy. And again, many of the immunological changes that are happening in the pregnancy may even fix some problems or may aggravate those problems. And those problems will be present for the rest of the life of the woman or maybe fix it for the rest of the life of the woman because they are dramatic changes that are occurring to the pregnancy and they are for a long term. So this is the, the basic concept of pregnancy in terms of the immunological changes. So defining again, there is no immune suppression, there is no temporary tolerance, and there is no temporary changes. Uh, there is a strong immune system. The changes in terms of tolerance are uh, long term for the rest of the life of the woman. And uh, more important, the immune system of the pregnant woman is very strong and will remain changed for the rest of the life of that woman. There is a second aspect that I think hopefully will uh, um, initiate some discussions in terms of inflammation and pregnancy. I am sure that many of you are familiar with this concept that pregnancy is defined as an anti-inflammatory condition. And the presence of any inflammatory process was defined as a potential breach of tolerance and a potential breach on the success of the pregnancy. Yeah. And to this group, I don't think to remind you, but just quickly, remember we have the, a, a, a pro-inflammatory, we call it the TH1, that is the dominance of cellular immunity, high levels of IL-2, interferon gamma, TNF alpha, and the anti-inflammatory we define as a dominance of human immunity, like a, 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 a cytokine environment that is like IL-4, TJ beta, IL-10, IL-6, and so on. Why is this important for this group? Because we know that our immune diseases, such as MS or A, they are depending on dominant cellular immunity, while the anti-inflammatories, uh, our immune diseases, such, such as SLE and, and, uh, and any antibody domi dominators as, grave, or as well, they are a, a TH2 um, lead by um, a TH2 dominant um, in, inflammatory domain. So it has been postulated that during the pre-pregnant pre woman they are dominated for a, a cellular immunity, which is true. A non-pregnant woman has a dominant cellular immunity. They has a stronger TH, um, uh, TH1 uh, response, an antiviral, for example, cytolytic immune responses is stronger in, in women compared to men. And I, I hope I will have time. I'll show you a little more where that difference starts. It starts in pregnancy. And during pregnancy, it was postulated that this uh, dominated immunity becomes an antibody uh, dominated immunity. And um, the rest of the, preg the whole pregnancy is an anti-inflammatory uh, anti condition. But when we look at the data and we look at the studies, there was a lot of contradiction in terms of uh, studies that will show that indeed there's a TH2 and studies that will find that there is neither TH1 nor TH2 and so on. We did a study several years ago when we look the first trimester of pregnancy comparing to the non-pregnant. So again, here is uh, some uh, cytokines. The arrows are the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And to our surprise at that time uh, was that the the pregnant woman, the samples that we took at the first trimester of the pregnancy were inflamed with a lot of inflammatory cytokines compared to the non-pregnant woman. Yeah. So we did then a full study looking at the different trimesters 
And what we found is that there was variations of the cytokines throughout the pregnancy. While in the first trimester, there was a lot of inflammatory cytokines. In the second trimester, those inflammatory cytokines were down. And as we got closer to the end of the pregnancy, the inflammatory cytokines went up again. So that's where we introduced this concept of differential inflammatory conditions throughout the pregnancy, where the early pregnancy is an inflamed condition or inflamed situation. The process of implantation is an inflammatory condition. And that is the reason is the symptoms, many of the symptoms that you refer, the, what the woman feels, the, the sick, uh, vomiting, um, and so on. And if you look in the blood, you will find that they have high levels of TNF alpha and many other inflammatory cytokines. They resemble exactly an inflammatory process. And in this talk, I don't have time to go uh, to explain to you why the inflammation is, is essential, but just to summarize quickly, inflammation, I think it is, is necessary for the process of placent, uh, sorry, of implantation. Yeah, I'll go in here in a moment. Yeah. As the pregnancy com uh, uh, continues, I mean, let me go here. The second trimester is really what it was conceived as the anti-inflammatory. And as you mentioned, and um, and we know, such as Graves' disease, uh, lupus, and so on. When a woman, uh, when sorry, um, MS and uh, especially MS, um, the patient has the symptoms who are very bad in the early pregnancy, uh, but at the second trimester they feel fantastic. Yeah, and many pregnant women because of the symptomatology who has disappeared in the second trimester, they would like to get stay in the second trimester for the rest of their lives. Why? Because the second trimester follows a dramatic change in the immunological milieu. And this is a time where all the cytokines, growth factors and so on, they are pushing for the growth. The, the inflammation has been completed because the, um, the, um, the process of uh, placentation and the tolerance has been also established. Yeah. At, when the second trimester initiates, there is no need of any the conflict or any other immunological reactions. Another aspect, also the first trimester is the most sensitive to infections. So the body of the mother is, is uh, activated to protect any potential infections. Infections that happens in the early first trimester will close the growing placenta, because there is still not even a, a full placenta and a full maternal circulation, it can cross, reach the fetus and will terminate the pregnancies. And, and, and that's what you don't want or will do miscarriages. So a very strong first trimester. The second trimester is the major change. Many autoimmune diseases, they feel much, much better in the second trimester, because indeed that is a period that the immunological changes has been already adapted, and now the focus is protection and growth. Um, this is the time also with antibodies start crossing the placenta. Yeah. This is the time with the normal uh, antibodies, as well as some abnormals, will go to the fetus and start preparing the protection of the, of the fetus against infections when the baby is born. So the contribution, the maternal immune contribution uh, to the fetus start at this time, second trimester. Not only, and this is something that we forget also, not only immunoglobulins are transferred during this period, also in maternal immuno immune cells, such as T regulatory cells or TH17 cells, they cross the placenta and they reach to the fetus during this time. So again, the transfer of, uh, of immunological factors during the period, this period is not limited to immunoglobulins, is also associated with immune cells. And the end of the pregnancy, and this is at the end of the pregnancy, the, the parturation is again associated with a process of inflammation. And then you will see how many of the symptomatology of the patients change 
from the second trimester where everything was good or everything was bad to the third trimester end of the pregnancy when the symptoms comes back because the placenta, sorry, the parturition is a process of um, inflammation. So now to put it in the context, and again, nothing is that you have inflammation and you cut, you, you, you click a switch and then you have an anti-inflammatory and so on. Absolutely not. It's a very interesting process that is start changing gradually as the fetus uh, grows. And to put it in other words, so this image, what it tries to explain is that inflammation is the dominant, sorry, inflammation is the dominant at the time of implantation. And as the fetus, uh, sorry, as the fetus, as the uh, embryo implants and the placenta start forming and they start secreting higher levels of ACG, the ACG and in addition of many other cytokines, especially ISGs, ISGs is interferon stimulated genes, will start changing the environment first at the decidua as well as systemic and inhibiting many of the pro-inflammatory factors that has been produced yeah, and changing uh, immunoglobulin production and so on and start stimulating macrophages, for example, who are um, M1 macrophages during the early pregnancy. They produce a lot of TNF alpha in the uterus, those macrophages. As ACG increase, yeah, those macrophages start shifting into an M2 and start producing anti-inflammatory cytokines. As placentation is completed around 13 weeks of the pregnancy and the maternal, circula maternal fetal circulation is established around 13 weeks, that's when there really there is a, a, a massive flow of, um, of signals coming from the maternal blood into the fetus. At that time already, the anti-inflammatory environment has been established. And that is the time when um, the, the ship that I, I, I was mentioning to you is changing now for the production of factors like TJ beta, uh, cytokines that are enhanced, tumor grow uh, and, and expansion. Uh, and as the pregnancy continues, uh, the, the, there is not an exactly another switch uh, immediately is the transition because as the fetus start growing and the placenta start aging, this clock, endometrial clock, the placenta clock, start sending signals to the mother and saying, okay, this is an organ that is aging. The immunological changes has been completed. The transfer of immunoglobulins has done, the transfer of immune cells to, from the mother to the fetus has been completed. And the parturation, the process of parturation is the real rejection again, yeah, because it's a strong inflammatory uh, condition. And again, when you have a strong inflammatory condition, anything that is sensitive to the immune system will be affected by that significant increase in inflammation. So this image and just summarized to you the evolutionary process uh, that happened in placentation, because it's interesting. Inflammation during implantation yeah, is an evolutionary situation that you find in all the species, all the species who at the end uh, will form a placenta. The, the critical change for the success of the pregnancy is the shift. Yeah, from pro-inflammatory into anti-inflammatory. Um, and the last uh, important shift for parturation is again going from anti-inflammatory and, and to a pro-inflammatory. And everything is timing in, in pregnancy and life in general, but pregnancy even more important because you can have the early changes from pro-inflammatory into an anti-inflammatory. So you have a normal implantation, you have a normal uh, placentation, you go and the baby is growing. But if the inflammation is happening early, if the signals that are maintaining this anti-inflammatory condition are blocked, for example, by infections, the inflammation, the same inflammatory process that you see in a normal parturition is going to happen in preterm birth, for example, but the only difference is, is it's at the wrong time. And that is what we call preterm birth. If you have an inflammation in the early pregnancy, uh, 
and there is an implantation, but there is not a shift into an anti-inflammatory condition and the inflammation continues going up, that is what will lead to again a parturation, but a parturation and a time where they never had the grow, and that is what we call the early pregnancy loss. Now, if there is no inflammation, and this is a subject that I touch, um, I think it will touch many of you, because in consultations uh, and in dealing with many uh, pregnant women who had autoimmune diseases, there is always, should we get pregnant or should not we get pregnant? And what they do is, okay, okay we, you're going to take pregnant, we're going to inhibit anything that is inflammation, and they don't get pregnant. Yeah. Because if there is no inflammation, that is what we call pre-implantation failure. Yeah, there will not be the implantation, again, because it's necessary inflammation. However, however, like in Crohn disease, women who have high levels of inflammatory signals with a lot of TNF alpha and so on, yeah, an excessive pro-inflammation is also going to affect and there will not be implantation. Yeah. So if there is a patient who has no symptoms of a massive inflammation, you, you don't want to inhibit that because you need that inflammation in order to have an implantation. But is a patient that is in higher levels of, TN, of TNF alpha, for example, in Crohn disease, uh, those ones you want to treat, you want to decrease the, the, the amount of inflammation and that woman will be able to get pregnant. So again, it's not so simple. It's not so simple because every stage is different. And if you're really dealing with the patient at this time, also you have to think if there is a pro an inflammatory process, the risk of preterm birth is very high. Oh, oh, if you have an inflammation or an abnormal change from that inflammation into the anti-inflammatory, you can have complications such as preeclampsia. Yeah? Uh, and, and we see many problems in graft disease uh, with um, uh, complications as preeclampsia. Yeah? Because some of the inflammatory process continues too long. There is not a divorce that you will see in early pregnancy, but there is a conflict because the inadequate shift in time and in levels that may then lead to, to the complications as um, as a uh, preeclampsia. This is another study which also published a few years ago showing how important is the shifts, the ratio between pro anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory. Very quickly, how are we doing time? Uh, what we show in this study is we took a cohort of, uh, of uh, IVF patients, so it's easy to follow them since the moment of implantation uh, we look at the cytokine profile in this woman uh, starting in uh, around three weeks, uh, all the way until 11 weeks. And we look also at blood samples. And again, following that, we will have a population that got a successful implantation. There was no miscarriage. But we had a group of women, the red ones, who got miscarriage. And what we did is we look at the ratio of anti versus pro-inflammatory. So... You see here that the ratio is low because that means uh, there is more inflammation in both groups, in the group who has a successful pregnancy as well as the group that has miscarriage. So implantation is inflammation. In the group who had a normal pregnancy, you can see that the ratio of anti-inflammatory is starting increasing at rate eight, eight weeks to 11 weeks. Yeah. While in the group that had miscarriage, the inflammation continued during the, this time. So there was implantation, but because there was no shift, at the end, the pregnancy ended, which I show you here in the early pregnancy loss. So the, immun the change on the immunological milieu is essential for the success of the pregnancy. If you intervene in, a, in, the, in the wrong way, you may induce a pregnancy complication or the termination of the pregnancy. Yeah. So this is uh, the basic concept that I wanted to show with you in terms of the, the immune system. Uh, it's an evolving process that is changing as the fetus grows and therefore is an adaptation that demands a, a careful understanding of what is going on. Pregnancy is not a monolithic process. 
is not that when the woman gets pregnant, her immune, change, her immune system change for the rest of the pregnancy. It's totally incorrect. So, of course, at the end of the day, we want to know what is the impact of what happened in the mother into the development of the fetus. And you uh, forgive me, but uh, the focus of my work is in environmental factors associated with infection as well as uh, pollution. And I'm going to show you this as examples in so using some of an animal models that are helping us to understand how uh, what happens in the mother affects the fetus. So let me introduce uh, or remind to some of you this concept that is defined as maternal immune activation. So what is the meaning of maternal immune activation? It refers to an activated maternal immune system. Yeah? And this maternal immune system might be triggered by infections, stress, diet, pollution, etc. And the characteristic is that you will have a cascade of cytokines and immunological alterations, immune cells, that are transmitted to the fetus, both cytokines as well as immune cells. And the transfer of the cytokines really can have two effects. And the majority of the people we look at the at the abnormal because from the abnormal we we learn the normal. But we're finding is going back to the graphic again. Maternal immune activation can have a, a positive effect if you want into the fetus that I, we call it resilience. And, and what it means during pregnancy, the mother is training the fetus to the survival when it goes out. Because remember. <laughs> the majority of the mammals and the majority of the population in this world are not delivering the babies in a sterile OR. Yeah. And uh, uh, during evolution, uh, we were not born in a sterile uh, ORs. Uh, our grandmothers and grand grandmothers and ancients, uh, they, de they delivered our uh, relatives uh, in the forest, in the fields, and the dust. So, there was no sterile uh, conditions uh, and the fetus had to survive. And the majority of fetus, they do survive uh, the delivery. Why? Because the maternal immune system was already training that fetus uh, to be strong and prepared to the signals that are will be exposed at the time of delivery. And, and you know, women who get infected with COVID or women who are vaccinated against COVID, what we may be doing is exactly that. The maternal immune system will recognize these viruses. Yeah, when it's vaccinated with virus, will send the antibody, the anti-COVID antibodies. It will go to the fetus and maybe educating the fetal immune system to be resistant if it's exposed to the virus in early age. And we know that uh, infants, they are very really, uh, resistant to, to uh, COVID to COVID, for example, COVID infection and other infections. This is an evolutionary adaptation that is essential for maintaining the, the, the species. The mother is training already the fetal immune system uh, to be resistant uh, to the factors that she is exposed during the pregnancy. Unfortunately, there is also a abnormal education that can happen during the pregnancy due to this maternal immune activation. And the effects in the, in, the, in the fetus, in the development of the immune system of the fetus, we can divide it in two processes, if you want, that will be um, uh, evident. One is during the childhood. Many of the changes that are happening during the pregnancy, you will see it on, during the childhood, such as response to vaccinations, allergies, our immune diseases, our immune diseases also. And you will see changes also in the adulthoods. Again, response to infections, cancer, uh, adult autoimmune diseases, uh, asthma, and so on. Yeah. So this effect on the education of the immune system may induce what we call a susceptibility for many of these diseases who only will be evident as the offspring uh, grows either in the childhood or in the adulthood. So maternal immune, maternal immune activations um, 
due to infections is becoming and it has been for me an interest for many, many years. And now with COVID is also presenting a, um, the importance of understanding what is happening. Because again, um, let me see. Um, yeah, so here's, let me go back. Because again, we don't know. We don't know, for example, with COVID, what will be the impact on those childs? Is going to happen uh, in the good one or is going to create a, a susceptibility to some of the diseases? The first, con the, the concept that is important from this is that everything that affects the mother, everything that affects the mother will affect the fetus. Evolutionary and thanks to evolution, in the majority of the cases is positive because it prepares us. That is the reason every generation is more resilient to the environment where they are born. But in, the, in many other cases, it leads to uh, diseases. The, the major studies that has been done in maternal immune activation and the offspring has been in brain development. And really this area uh, explodes because an observation that was found in Finland associated with psychiatric dis diseases such as schizophrenia. It was um, identified that in a period of time, there was a significant increase on the number of adults uh, developing schizophrenia in Finland. So the good thing is that they keep record of everything. So they were able to follow up these uh, patients with the schizophrenia all the way back to the, uh, to the pregnancy. And what they found that they had in common is that all their mothers were infected with influenza A, the pandemic of influenza that happened in around the 50s. Yeah. So the pandemic at the end was transmitted, was, uh, um, yeah, was, was uh, translated into an increase in psychiatric, psychiatric and neurological disorders. Why I'm telling you this? Because it has been a fight, a, a very difficult fight for the groups against vaccination uh, during this period of COVID. And many women, they prefer, <laughs> they prefer to get infected uh, rather than um, get a vaccine. And we did a study also in, in, in South America, and we found that almost around 40% um, of pregnant women, uh, they were not diagnosed with COVID, uh, but they were infected. So the question is, what is going to happen to those pregnant women who got infected? How that infection is going to translate in the long-term health of the individuals? And since then, there has been a lot of studies showing that indeed inflammatory signals uh, cross the placenta, reach the fetus, and they will not develop abnormal um, microscopic um, uh, things that you can see in the fetus, they have an impact in some areas on the brain developmental. And many of those now has been clearly demonstrated that are associated with autism spectrum disorders and even susceptibility to second hits such as stress and then induction of drug abuse. So what is happening in terms of the inflammation in the mother is going to have an effect in, in the and the behavior and the developmental behavior of the offspring. But for us, the major question has been what happened to the immune system? Uh, we There is more and more data showing at the brain. There is no data showing what happened into the immune system of the fetus. Although now there is a lot of things, there is a lot of interest and a lot of data coming out. Um, and we're now better understanding those changes. So in the last few minutes, um, I want to go and show you quickly some aspects of our animal models about viral infections and what it induces. And again, when viruses cross the placenta in the early pregnancy, they kill the fetus, yeah, because there is still not a well-established immune protection. But if the infection comes after when placentation has established, the majority of the cases there will be a success of the pregnancy. Yeah. However, the response to the virus it will induce an infection and something will change. And we did some studies using, um, for example, a, a, a herpes viruses that are 
in many cases infected uh, infect the mother. Um, but we look at the mouse infected with the herpes virus, and indeed nothing happened to the pregnancy. Again, we were injecting the virus uh, after placentation, when placentation took place. Here is an interesting aspect that I want to mention to you because of the understanding what happened during pregnancy. Uh, what I'm showing you here is the viral titers in two types of cells. The green is the stroma cells and the blue is the trophoblast. You see in the viral titers in the green cells, uh, they continue growing and they go down here. And it's not because it has been controlled, it's because the cells died. But the, plus, the trophoblasts, who are the cells of the placenta, they are infected, but the viral titers never goes up because the placenta gets infected by the majority of the virus, but it has a high capacity to control a viral infection. An important aspect of that, because even though the mother gets infected, we take organs from the mother, the spleen, the seed, the leaf nose, the placenta, all of them are infected. The fetus is never infected with the virus. Yeah. And why? Because it's exactly what I told you at the beginning. The pregnant woman, the placenta, the decidua, and the immune system of the mother has developed very strong mechanisms in order to prevent viral infections uh, reaching the fetus. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and this is critical also in terms of many of those inflammatory processes that occur in, 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 um, in our immune diseases, even though Viruses in this case, the trigger of the changes in the immune response do not cross to the fetus. When we look at the fetus and we look at the immune, at the cytokines in the fetus, this is the column of the one that the mother was infected. The fetus has a lot of inflammatory cytokines, no viruses in the fetus. Again, proving that, and those cytokines may come from the mother, may come from the mother. Yeah. So, inflammation that is happening in the maternal side will reach the fetus and will induce a fetal inflammatory syndrome. If it's controlled, it may be protective. If it's not controlled, it may be detrimental. And I think I'm going to show you in a minute. In the mouse, we can do something that we cannot do in human, that is to take those embryos, do sections and look at organs. And what we found in those inflamed uh, organs is that there was a lot of damage in the vascularity. So inflammatory signals that are damaging, damaging the, 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 um, the endothelial cells and they become leaky and you have a lot of inflammation and, um, and hemorrhage in many uh, developing organs such as the lungs, uh, the pericardium, the more important. We found this before Zika, the inflammatory process was affecting the development of the cortex. And I remember when we tried to publish this paper, this was around 2010, the reviewers, and I have printed, and I think I'm going to frame in it, the, the one reviewer saying there is no human evidence that viruses or maternal inflammation will have an effect on the development of the, of the, of the brain fetus. And then Zika came and microcephaly, because of the presence of Zika, it was demonstrated. So, a massive inflammatory process, depending on the time, is going to have an effect in the development of multiple organs. <clears throat> there is the aspect now of um, on the long term effect of the fetal or the maternal inflammation on the development of the fetus. Yeah. And there is many gaps understanding how environmental factors can induce maternal inflammation and how this role of maternal immune cells will affect also the, the fetal immune development. And but more important, I think, more important, but also very important is what are the windows of susceptibility that the fetal immune system has in terms to be affected by the maternal signals? So what I'm going to show you is in, in the few minutes that we have left is, and I will go very quickly through this, um, and I apologize, uh, just to, to give you the final signal, is how non-infections uh, stimuli, who could be any type that is non-viral or, or bacteria, can affect the system in system. We took something that, uh, because I'm dealing here, that is Detroit, 
which is the capital of Pitt and Bird, and it has a major problem of pollution. And I think Cleveland is not so far away from Detroit and the problems that Detroit has. We know that air pollution is the killer, is the silent killer because it's translated into many health diseases. But we know very little how is the impact of pollution in children's health and especially related to the development of the fetal immune system. We know that in Detroit, there is a high rate of asthma in children and a high rate of inflammatory um, respiratory infections uh, um, in, the, in the children and especially the boys. So what I'm going to show you is exactly how we try to understand what is happening with that. So we develop a model, an animal model, where we expose pregnant mice in, with benzene. And benzene is the main pollutant that you have either in the cars or mothers who smoke cigarettes. So what we did is the following. This is just to show you our, our uh, the, what we build. That is uh, for the mouse. We can put the mouse here. We're exposed to benzene during the pregnancy. We let the mouse, uh, uh, sorry, we collect samples in the mother. Oh, let me go stop here. The first question that we had is, is this pollu is pollution able to induce maternal inflammation? Yeah. So again, we expose them to the benzene. We collect the bladder from the mother uh, at the close to the end of the pregnancy. That is day 17.5. The mouse has 19 days of pregnancy and we look at cytokines. In short, yes, pollution induced maternal inflammation and a very strong maternal inflammation with high levels of IL-12, TNF-alpha, GCSF, and IL-17. So pollution can induce maternal inflammation. That is suggests that it could have an impact on many fetal organs and their development. Yeah. So we look at one of the problems, as I mentioned, that we have here in Detroit, that is problems with respiratory infections. A lot of children has a high susceptibility to viral respiratory infections. So what we did is we exposed again the pregnant woman to benzene. We led the mice to the liver. And then we challenges when they were um, young adults with a respiratory uh, virus, MHV68, which is a natural pathogen of rodents. It will not do anything to a healthy uh, mouse. Uh, it is a respiratory virus because it induces an inflammation in the lungs. It doesn't cross the placenta. That's something that we have shown. And the infection is controlled by CD8 positive T cells. So in short, this is the message. If the mother was exposed to benzene and we know now there is an inflammation in, during the pregnancy, look at here the viral titers and the groups. Uh, if there is a, a, a normal pregnancy, the offspring in a normal pregnancy is infected with the virus is nicely controlled. But offsprings, from mothers in, exposed to benzene, they cannot control the respiratory infection. They have a lot of titers. And the most interesting aspect that I leave you the message here is that there is a depletion or a damage in the thymus of those fetus to the development of CD8 positive cells, the essential cells required for the antiviral response. So offsprings of mother exposed to benzene during pregnancy, the thymus has been affected and it doesn't produce CD8 positive cells. The fascinating aspect is this. The sensitivity is mainly in the male mice. The females continues responding normally to the virus. So this is a clear anti uh, sexual dimorphism and with this i finish i'm going to show you uh, this is new data and new outcome again very important to understand that because also we treat both boys and girls uh, in the same way in terms of susceptibility and clearly there is a sexual dimorphism in the response during pregnancy during pregnancy two factors to maternal inflammation, yeah. 
and, and again, our immunities and so on. So let me go here. The quest, we were breaking our heads to try to understand what is the sexual dimorphism. Is the sexual dimorphism happening after birth or before birth? And one of the targets for maternal inflammation that I, I show it to you is the placenta. And the question has been always, are all the placentals equal? So we know that there is a boy who is a male and a girl that is the girl because the Y chromosome, but the placenta has always been considered as an asexual. And the placenta has always been conceived to respond equally to the maternal stimulus. The answer is the opposite. So we took male and female placenta. First thing, we did RNA-seq, and you can see here, the male and female placenta are not the same. Yeah. There are major differences between a male and female placenta. and has nothing related to the Y and a chromosome. Yeah, We remove the genes associated to the Y chromosome. So the differences are uh, separated from the, the, the chromosome component. So we wanted to, know, and the interesting aspect, the male placenta, the difference between the male and the female placenta is also associated to immunological aspects. The innate immune responses are highly activated in the, main plac in the male placenta compared to the female placenta. But let's go back to now the, the, the dimorphies in response to the, um, the inflammatory stimuli. And here comes the interesting thing. Yeah. Look, here you have a male placenta responding to benzene. Dramatic changes, dramatic changes between the two. That's not the case to the female placenta. There are changes, but the changes are, are, are less and the changes are not so um, strong as we see in the, in the male. So we look what is common between the male and the female, and there is only 26 pathways who are common, the male and female. But now look at the pathways that uh, differentially affected in the female, 76 against 207. What I told you at the beginning, the male is more sensitive to the, um, the, the um, inflammatory stimulus comparing to the, the, and interestingly, the majority of the genes who are affected in the male in response to the inflammatory signals from the mother are related to type one interferon, innate immune response. Suggesting now that that placenta or the signals that are coming from that placenta are going to have an impact on the male, in the male immune system yeah? and the, the offspring, the male offspring may be more uh, susceptible to the environment. The female. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So this is my last slide. The female is different and is mainly associated with metabolic changes. So um, in summary, inflammations in the mother would affect the placenta. The inflammation from the placenta is going to affect the fetal development and this is going to be translated into the child in response to environmental virus and signals. So this is a challenge to us to understand a specific signals in terms of the effect um, in, the, in, in, the OSP, in the future OSP. And, and with that, I finish on. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. That was a very fascinating presentation, especially as somebody coming from adult endocrinology. It's it's. It is, it's very interesting that in, we, you always tend to think of pregnancy as an immunosuppressed state, and that is not the case. I also hope that you get invited to the climate change forums because of your research, because of what you showed with the benzene exposure, and also how it might link to why the incidence of autism is increasing more among boys than girls, possibly because of the differential response of the placenta to the activators. Um, we have a, a question from Dr. Feynman. Uh, you commented on a role for HCG in implantation. What replaces HCG in non-primate species? So, sorry, what changes the HCG in non-primates? So what replaces HCG in non-primate species? Yeah, so that is a very, very good question. 
so, so let, let's go. When when we're talking about non primates, are we referring to n non um, um, no placent no placental form uh, animals or species? I presume that is it. Yeah. Okay. So. You don't need ACG. You need any nothing to uh, replace ACG because there is no shift in the, from the pro-inflammatory into anti-inflammatory. Uh, again, <laughs> you saw that I was uh, struggling uh, what to show you guys that will be interesting for you. But if you take the the um, the kangaroo, the kangaroo, for example, is the species that is between the pre-placentation and the post-placentation. You in the in the kangaroo. Uh, or the marsupials, in general, the marsupials, you have implantation, but there is no placentation. Uh, the marsupials, the the uh, the fetus will come out and it will to the the sac and it will grow in the sac. Why? Because there is no ACG, there is no anti-inflammatory signals. So evolutionary, when this this trophoblast start producing ACG or ACG related hormones, that's when we think the process of placenta, the changes in the endometrium are taking place, the anti-inflammatories are taking place and placentation will occur. So ACG is an evolutionary component of placentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, one more uh, question from my end. Um, we talked about the fact that Graves' disease actually improves in the last trimester of pregnancy. You showed that the last trimester of pregnancy moving on to parturition is more of a pro-inflammatory state. So is this more of a selective pro-inflammatory state or how does that, how do you explain yeah. that? So if you look at the ACG, the ACG uh, in, uh, if related to the ACG increases during the first trimester and then goes down. It's totally going down. Yeah. So now the parturation is an inflammatory process that will induce contraction of the spiral arteries. Sorry, contraction of arteries, contraction of the muscle um, is a very, yes, yeah, if you want to use the word, is a very selective inflammatory process, but it's affecting the whole sy system of the mother. So it has high levels again of TNF alpha. It has high levels of uh, oxy of um, uh, COX two and and so on. So very selective, but classical pro-inflammatory. Thank you. Um, well, the last thing I want to comment on after watching your presentation is it shows how important as a public health policy maternal health is when we are talking about the future of the species, or I should say the future health of our children or the next generation. Um, I don't think we have any questions in our chat right now. So thank you, Dr. Moore. We are at the end of the presentation. For everybody who's attending, our next EMI Live is on April 18th. We have Dr. Robert Gabe, who's the Chief Science and Medical Officer at the American Diabetes Association. And uh, we'll be looking forward to his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Moore, again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.